Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Rounds on Wednesday, November 1st. I will go ahead and get started with the first case. I've done everything that I need to. Okay, uh, so this first case is um, the right eye from a 15 year old beagle, spade female. Um, we got surprisingly little history um, given what we have here when we hemisected the eye, uh, but they say blindness, glaucoma, uveitis slash hyphema, um, and that's all they said. Uh, IOP was 30, so yes, glaucoma. Uh, when we received the eye, uh, we felt that it was quite bouphthalmic. And when we hemisected it, we found uh, an expansile off-white mass that was within the anterior uvea, filling the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber. Um, the cornea was also uh, pretty opaque. Also in this image, you can see that the lens is a little bit cloudy, so there's a cataract. And the retina is detached with some periretinal hemorrhage in the subretinal space and in the vitreal space. Um, so that is the majority of what we see in our gross photo. So here is the eye in the subgross. Uh, it's looking quite pink. Um, you can see some remnants of uveal tissue uh, in the areas where you can see a few brown cells. Um, this is the cornea here. Here's the lens. Here's the detached retina. And then full screen. Full screen, I'm, I'm being told. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, so there's that detached retina with the periretinal hemorrhage. And so basically, we have a mass that at this magnification um, is not forming any particular structures. Um, it is diffusely effacing the anterior uveal stroma or outline. All right. So we will start at the cornea. Uh, the cornea itself. Uh, the epithelium is hyperplastic. And uh, it has this hyper eosinophilic layer there. So that's keratinization that's kind of flaking off. And then the stroma itself is pretty busy with, um, and it's populated by blood vessels and probably a few inflammatory cells here and there. Uh, Here's Desmond's membrane. I think that's probably an artifactual separation. And then we're going to go ahead and move into the mass, but let's go back out to low mag. I'm going to start down here. So it really does just uh, completely efface um, uh, the uveal structures. Um, and as I said, at low mag, it's not really forming any particular structures. So it's basically forming sheets. Um, and even at this low magnification, you can start to pick up some really big cells. They become even more obvious the closer you get. Um, so we have um, the most obvious feature here is the great variation in cell size. So that's anisocytosis. And then you can tell that the larger cells have multiple nu nuclei. Um, and there are quite a few of them. Um, the rest of the cells, uh, well, all of the cells have variably distinct cell borders um, and varying amounts of vacuolated eosinophilic to amphiphilic cytoplasm uh, with some coarsely clumped chromatin and variably prominent, probably single or double nuclei. nucleoli. Um, let's move around a little bit. So as you move around, you can also pick up quite a few uh, mitotic figures, some of which are bizarre as we would move around. Um, somewhere up here, uh, there's some remnant uveal melanocytes and here's some remnant collagen of the uveal stroma. Might be the indestructible collagen as Dr. D calls it, because uh, it often can be found even when the, the uh, uvea is quite effaced. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the rest of the globe. Um, so this cataract can be appreciated at low mag where we can see that there's some liquefaction of the cortical lens fibers, uh, where you can still see some of the intact, uh, fibers of the nucleus. So there is a cataract. Um, as we move back, there is that detached retina. 
And then there's quite a bit of hemorrhage around it. There's also a pretty decent um, retro lenticular membrane um, that probably stems from the ciliary body and then spans the anterior vitreous. So here's that retro lenticular membrane. Um, there are also quite a few uh, free floating round cells that uh, just like the ones in the mass themselves are quite pleomorphic. So we've got some really big ones that are multinucleated. Um, so no, no, um, uh, probably these are going to be sloughed or um, never mind, sloughed neoplastic cells. Forgot the word starts with an E. Um, and there are areas of necrosis within the mass. I didn't dwell on those, um, but they are there. And move back here. So the, the optic nerve head is um, distorted by the detached retina. So um, this uh, type of neoplasm in a dog that is basically a round cell neoplasm with really great um, pleomorphism. So the cells are quite pleomorphic here. Um, our first, second, and third rule outs for this are a histiocytic sarcoma. Um, I did give a second differential of a very anaplastic lymphoma, but I really consider this the most likely diagnosis to be uh, histiocytic sarcoma. Um, so uh, once histiocytic sarcomas are diagnosed in the eye, um, unfortunately, there's a pretty poor prognosis um, in that the average uh, lifespan for the patients after that point is about three months. Um, sometimes we get a history of um, other uh, lesions that are found before they actually nucleate, so when they stage the patient, um, but oftentimes we don't get any other additional history. This one had no additional history um, uh, to suggest that they were suspicious of some sort of a metastatic neoplasm here. Um, I should point out that we don't necessarily know whether histiocytic sarcomas in the eye are primary to the eye or are metastatic lesions. Uh, it's possible that they could be both, or I mean, either or, not both, but either or. Um, and uh, yeah, so there we go. So we typically offer CD204. That is the histiocytic uh, marker that we have readily available to us here at University of Wisconsin. Um, and for the most part, these guys are going to be positive for CD204. So uh, we don't have the chat up, but it doesn't look like anybody has any questions. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Okay. All right. We will move on to our next one. Okay. This is the left eye of a 12 and a half year old mixed breed dog, spayed female. Um, the history we got for this one was uh, probable intraocular neoplasia. Uh, left eye, three sites of mass extension through the limbal sclera, unable to view the intraocular contents due to diffuse corneal vascularization. Um, and then yes, there's secondary glaucoma, uh, severe bufalmia, increased intraocular pressure was documented in May of 2023. So about five months ago, they knew that this dog had glaucoma. Um, so when we received the eye um, from the front on view here, you can see here's the cornea and it is opaque and wrinkled. And there is this uh, multilobular sort of tan bulge of the limbus uh, multifocally around the eye there. And then when the eye was hemisected, um, we have a brown to tan to off-white mass that is uh, within and expanding the anterior uvea. You can see it's extending back into the choroid in this image. Um, and then something looks like it's going on down here in the choroid right down here. Um, so there we go. I will show you the histo now. Um, so just like uh, the gross photo showed, we do have a mass whose composition varies from being heavily pigmented here to less well pigmented adjacent to that. And then on the other side of the globe, um, 
actually what we end up having is a mass that's quite necrotic. And you can see these little lobules of neoplastic cells that have a red dot in the middle. And that is because they are surviving around blood vessels. So that's what we call that. Um, and then back here in the choroid, there's more of that extensively necrotic neoplasm with some islands of viable cells. Um, and you can see the neoplasm also extends right into the optic nerve. Here's another an extra slice of the uh, globe. Once again, you can see that that sort of uh, purplish mass uh, does expand the choroid and that in this area, oops, up there, uh, it's uh, extensively necrotic. So we're probably gonna jump into that extra slice. Um, so this is not a, necessarily a diagnostic challenge because um, as we can see that this neoplasm has some areas that are heavily pigmented. So right off the bat, we're thinking this is a melanocytic neoplasm. Um, uh, I guess, and so that then, then we go on to assume that the areas that are less well pigmented are all part of the same neoplastic cell population and that the cells have just lost their heavy uh, cyto cytoplasmic pigmentation. Um, another uh, very rare possibility is that this is some sort of um, it's an eye with two different tumors uh, that are unrelated to each other. Uh, in this case, I'm pretty sure it's from the same population. So as I said, I'm going to start back here. So this is that extra slice that we looked at in the subgross. So up here is the anterior portion of the eye. There's some conjunctival epithelium. So this is uh, the, the mass is extended directly through the limbal sclera and has formed a mass in the episclera. Here you can start to pick up some of that sclera right here, and it's kind of split and expanded by that neoplasm. The ciliary body is infiltrated and, and expanded, and then here we're in the choroid because this is, I think, the retina. Uh, but anyway, we're going to move back here into this area of the choroid. So these neoplastic cells maybe are forming some vague lobules, maybe some trabeculae. Let me go higher. They're spindle shaped with variably distinct cell borders, um, moderate amounts of amphiphilic cytoplasm that can be kind of fibrillar. And then rarely you can find some of them do actually have melanin in their cytoplasm. Um, like here's one that's pretty obviously neoplastic and you can see that little dusting of melanin there in its cytoplasm. Um, and then, so they have uh, variably shaped nuclei with some dispersed chromatin and very large prominent uh, magenta nucleoli. Um, you can also see in this image uh, that there are quite a few mitotic figures, some of which are bizarre. So there's some atypical mitoses happening. Um, so all of these features put together equal a malignant melanoma, um, which is the more minority of melanocytic neoplasms diagnosed in the dog eye. Um, I don't actually know what percentage are considered to be malignant. Um, but um, for most quote unquote malignant neoplasms, which we define because they have um, more than three mitotic figures in 10 high powered fields, um, at least that's the number that we use in, in uh, Coplow here. Um, most of the malignant melanomas in dog eyes uh, will not metastasize. So they're, they're considered to be malignant histologically um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be um, a poor prognosis for the patient. Um, this is actually an exception to that rule, at least in my opinion. Uh, not only is it quite extensive, which doesn't necessarily mean everything or suggest that it's going to be a poor prognosis, but um, it's also within uh, blood vessels. So here we are in the limbal sclera, and this is um, one of the veins, I believe, of the scleral venous plexus that is chock full of neoplastic cells. So I think there's vascular invasion here. And actually, as we move back, here's another one that I think where the neoplastic cells are in the lumen. And then when we move back into the choroid, right around the optic nerve here, I was pretty convinced that there were some in the choroidal blood vessels as well. Might not be able to find those at the moment.
Okay, I'm not gonna waste any more time looking. Uh, anyway, so this one I think might be one of the rare ones that maybe has a higher chance of metastasis. Um, it doesn't sound like they staged the patient prior to the enucleation, but uh, maybe they have gone back and done it now. Um, so anyway, most malignant melanomas in dog eyes are not uh, biologically malignant, so they don't tend to metastasize, um, but we call them malignant based on that increased mitotic rate. Um, of the ones that we do diagnose as being malignant, apparently about two to 5% of those will metastasize. So once again, a relatively low percentage of them will uh, cause metastatic disease. Um, and that is about all I have to say about this case. So there we go. <laughs> Now, I guess I can go back to the diagnosis. You can see where I've written malignant melanoma. There we go. Extensive anterior uveal malignant melanoma uh, with vascular invasion. And I'm pretty sure it was in the optic nerve in this case. So there's always the chance that this one will also um, travel off the optic nerve to the brain, unfortunately. All right. <laughs> All right, the next case. Oh, first, do we have any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, we have a 4.8 year old spade female Labrador retriever mix. Um, the dog was described as blind since adoption in 2021. Um, the eye exam showed anterior uveitis, partial retinal attachment, uh, and small and large areas of cellular infiltrate that were either retina or subretina and that were tan, white, yellow. Um, there was also some sneakiation and secondary glaucoma um, and some retinal degeneration noted in the other eye, which they referred to as mild and age-related. Um, so uh, on the gross exam of this eye, one of the things that uh, may be most noticeable right away um, are these sort of multifocal to coalescing regions of tan, white, yellow uh, foci. Um, so uh, this is very interesting and probably corresponds to what they were seeing uh, clinically in the back of the eye. Um, there is also uh, an at least partial retinal detachment. You can see the retina sort of folded to one side here, which is making these areas of um, discoloration uh, more evident. I'm being cagey about what they are because we'll see histologically. Um, I believe also... So basically the gross examiner, when they sectioned this globe, um, basically uh, questioned whether there was a hard region in the ciliary body um, and sections of this globe were ultimately actually decalcified before submission for further processing. So that's also something that's worth noting. Um, <clears throat> so that is the gross and I will not advance the PowerPoint and show you the answer. I will switch over here. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with the uh, hemisection of the globe that did not capture the really hard area, um, and we'll move to other sections that capture that afterwards. Um, so our globe is here with the cornea sort of down and to the right. Um, and one thing that we notice here is that there is distortion of the corneal angle um, and sort of anterior uvea. Um, and it almost, from lower magnification, gives you this sense of like goniogenesis. But when you drop in on what's going on here, we have some interesting findings. So uh, there is this sort of iris-like tissue stretching across where the uh, angle usually should have been, or the, the nice structures of the angle should have been. Um, but what's jumbled up in here is sort of fragments of a epithelium, um, some melanin-laden cells. And then you can even see on this end here, this curled fragment of peripheral decimase membrane just sort of embedded in the midst of all this jumbled up anterior uveal tissue. Um, and if we head towards where that was, that there was that sort of hump, um, there's this dense fibrous tissue, uh, there is sort of a segmented, uh, there's a big goober on the slide. There we go. Uh, there are these fragments of decimase membrane again. So here's a nice peripheral fragment there. Here's another end. Here's where it sort of splits and there's fibrotic tissue between it. Um, 
So this is actually uh, more likely to be an acquired distortion of the iridocorneal angle um, associated with like this malformation and tearing and fragmentation of the uvea and of peripheral dust maze. Um, it's also going on in other areas, although not as um, sort of nice. Uh, but we have sort of this um, fragmentation of peripheral decimase membrane. We actually on this uh, side have the corneal endothelium extending uh, further than it should, um, sort of onto almost the base of the iris, um, which can sometimes happen with uh, just sort of disruption of decimase in the endothelium in general. Um, so just some interesting findings up here and definitely a reason for glaucoma to develop in this case. Um, and we'll revisit the anterior uvea with the other sections, but before we do, um, we'll go back to that area with the tan white yellow infiltrate, and as it turns out, it's really dense mineralization. So um, it is mostly retinal, um, so we have this very, very um, severely atrophied retina. This is all that's left of it. Uh, there's not much of an RPE visible here either. Um, and then just this multifocal coalescing dense mineralization in that atrophied retina. Um, which is presumed a form of dystrophic uh, mineralization in this case, uh, sort of injury or degeneration of the tissue and then mineral deposits secondary to that. Um, sort of an artifactually uh, separated area of this mineral because it's so hard to cut through, um, but you can see the fragments of the remaining mineral at the edges. Um, and we have our evidence of glaucoma and we have our partial retinal attachment. So all of the things that we saw before, this is a little bit more spared of a retina, um, probably spared somewhat from the glaucoma, but not really all that much. And we have an outer atrophy anyway, because it's been detached from its blood supply, but here's the detached portion of it. So before we move on from this case, the hard area that was um, particularly decalcified, and as the gross examiner uh, correctly uh, assumed, it is bone. Um, so we have decalcified section, which is why it's no longer deeply purple. Um, and we just have sort of a collagen matrix left. Um, but this is bone, what decalcified bone looks like in any case. Isn't it lovely? Um, and it's been uh, deposited sort of in the uh, area of the iridocorneal angle. We have another fragment of the end of peripheral dust maze looking all sad and broken and curled up. Um, and it's embedded in the uh, ciliary body itself and along the anterior surface of the iris. Um, and in addition to this bone, there's also just generally some very dense uh, fibrosis going on um, of the anterior uvea and filling in sort of the gap between uh, that section, this section, and sort of filling in a gap between the ciliary body and the sclera, so sort of in the superciliary space, which is more of a potential space uh, that is probably formed in this case because at some point we presume it was torn away from its normal anatomic position. Um, so this is most likely uh, representative of the chronic sequela of cyclodialysis, um, so and also probably trauma. Um, so we get trauma, especially blunt trauma, tends to distribute out towards the periphery, uh, causes peripheral breaks in decimase membrane, um, can cause cyclodialysis, and then basically over time it'll heal back in a funny sort of uh, jumbled up uh, anatomic orientation, um, and uh, le leading to glaucoma in this case. Um, and then again, presumably the dystrophic mineralization of the retina in the back. So um, kind of a, a bit of a unique uh, manifestation of ocular trauma in this case of a dog. Uh, there's some select uh, diagnoses from this, mostly the ones that were related to the trauma um, or presumed trauma. Uh, and that's that. Uh, any questions or comments on this case? Okay, the next one is a six-year-old neutered male German Shepherd. Um, they say that there was a corneal growth which started approximately two years ago per the owner, uh, began to grow more rapidly over the last six months. Notably, they say, that, so this is the left eye, and notably they say that the right eye has pants or chronic superficial keratitis, which is overrepresented in German Shepherd dogs something to keep in mind. Um, so on the gross examination of this globe, um, we can see where at least sort of deep corneal stroma is uh, maybe at this level, but the rest of the cornea is very uh, much expanded and distorted um, by this red-brown ma brown mass, 
which also has these multifocal sort of cavitative areas. Um, so this is very interesting and suggestive of what this diagnosis ultimately is. Um, the rest of the eye isn't uh, all that affected. Um, and I guess one more thing to point out is that there may be some slight extension into the conjunctiva. It's really hard to tell at this level um, and definitely something that is um, interesting to, to think about in this case later. Um, but uh, most of it uh, is confined to the cornea, this mass. Okay, how old did you say this Six years, two months. Mm -hmm. See if we can do a subgross first. Wow. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so here's the globe. We have this little fun arm of conjunctiva out the side. <laughs> um, but the main thing is this corneal mass. Um, and it's looking very blood filled uh, from low magnification. And let's just get even closer with some better focus. We've landed on an ulcerated area. Here we go. Um, so uh, this mass is composed of these dilated, aberrant, and blood-filled vascular channels. And sometimes it becomes even more solid than that and ends up just being these intersecting streams of spindle cells. Um, and those spindle cells are neoplastic and they can be fairly pleomorphic. Um, and there are some mitotic figures among them. Here's one, for example. So that's sort of, sort of one of the more solid areas. And if we walk over to some of the more blood-filled areas, you end up with this more um, pattern of anastomosing collagen beams lined by similar plump uh, spindle cells. Um, so this is a hemangiosarcoma in the cornea. Um, we do have areas of uh, extensive ulceration over the ocular surface here, um, overlying the mass, and there is necrosis in the mass, um, which probably wasn't particularly comfortable for this dog. Uh, and again, it's kind of hard to tell if at the edges here it may somewhat involve the conjunctiva, um, but most of the mass is confined to the corneal stroma. Um, so uh, ultimately, this one is most likely a corneal hemangiosarcoma. Um, and the reason why these cases are interesting and cool is that the cornea in normal conditions should be a relatively avascular structure. Um, so, and yet we, here we have a neoplasm of vascular endothelium. Um, and so in these cases, uh, we presume that there is uh, some chronic history or chronic background of corneal inflammation, which would lead to vascularization um, and then vascular endothelium being in the cornea that can then become neoplastic. Um, and indeed, we did have that history of panis in the other eye of this dog. Um, so presumably this eye may have been affected at some point as well. Um, so panis, chronic superficial keratitis, certainly a condition that would lead to chronic inflammation, a pro-inflammatory environment, and the blood vessels being in the point of stroma. Um, and then also even in our examined sections, we have evidence of a chronic uh, inflammatory corneal con condition still, even though the mass is occupying a lot of the cornea. Um, there's actually some superficial cornea that is captured uh, that is not overtly occupied by the neoplasm. And we do have uh, corneal epithelial hyperplasia and keratinization and some degree of pigmentation. Um, we have some melanin laden cells scattered in the superficial cornea and um, we have lymphocytes and plasma cells here. So uh, evidence of uh, some chronic corneal inflammation in this case uh, by history and by histology. Um, so just a cool case of uh, corneal hemangiosarcoma. Where's this dog? Um, somewhere sunny, perhaps. Uh, California. <laughs> uh, you do wonder in cases like this uh, about the UV radiation component. Uh, so it's good to ask where the dog is from. Um, and uh, no solelastosis that I saw in these sections, um, but uh, there could still have been a role of UV, um, theoretically, at least in the development of panis. Um, but uh, good question. Uh, let me pull this back up again. And there's that. And then any other questions or comments? No. Okay.
All right. All right, so next up, we have the left globe from a 14 and a half year old Havanese female spade dog. Um, and our finite history that we got for this was just a uh, progressive vascular response, suspects cancer. Um, no notation on uh, IOP or glaucoma or how the other eye is doing or any other general medical, con med medical conditions. Um, so that is all we had there. Um, so grossly, our major finding was that um, half of the cornea was uh, very opaque and like very thickened. Um, the rest of the globe um, is uh, not too bad looking. So we'll jump right into the histology. Uh, similar to the gross, uh, most of the changes are right up here in the cornea. Um, the remaining portions of the globe aren't uh, too remarkable. So it's very thick, it's very cellular. Um, so let's go take a close look. All right. So we can see that it's pretty cellular here. Uh, got some nice wrinkling of decimase membrane as we go around. Um, the cornea is infiltrated and in, in faced by this infiltrate, kind of extends a little bit out into um, kind of a limbal sclera here. And as we get closer, um, this is a population of kind of bland looking spindle cells admixed uh, with a lot of plasma cells and lymphocytes. Um, they have indistinct cell borders, um, small to moderate amounts of eosinophilic cytoplasm. Um, as I said, pretty bland looking. Um, in some regions, like right here, uh, these cells form like a nice herringbone pattern, which we can see uh, sometimes in other tissues uh, associated with uh, sarcomas. However, this is most likely an inflammatory response. Let's look at these cells out here. Um, they get a little bit more polygonal, polygonal out at the per, uh, periphery here, um, kind of around blood vessels a little bit. Um, and again, lots of plasma cells and lymphocytes, um, maybe a few neutrophils and such going on. Um, uh, there is a very small, uh, delicate um, membrane along the uh, iris leaflet and a very uh, small smattering of lymphocytes and plasma cells in the iris itself. Um, and then the infiltrate as it comes along, um, we kind of lose the spindle cell population and just becomes more um, inflammatory uh, on the other side of the cornea. Um, and so, uh, just sort of a funny story. We did have an ophthalmology resident uh, with us at the time when we were looking at this case, and she described this beautifully as a tumor because um, she had it had a lot of features. Um, but the more experienced people who have seen this a lot more um, <laughs> were more suspicious of it being a granulomatous inflammation, um, and so we offered a CV two hundred four. which as mentioned previously, does stain uh, histiocytes, macrophages, and it lights up beautifully, even in the areas where we have that nice herringbone pattern. And that pattern is probably uh, more likely being produced because of the macrophages dissecting between um, into the cornea and it just kind of serendipitously creating that pattern. Um, so it's a very nice example of a severe uh, granulomatous um, and lymphoplasmocytic um, keratitis. 
Um, it was sort of building off of some cases that we saw last week in rounds. Um, if you weren't here or need a refresher, um, I recommend you go check out um, our YouTube video um, from that case. Um, and so um, this seems to be kind of in the uh, kind of immune mediated idi idiopathic um, realm of things, um, kind of on the spectrum um, with necrotizing scleritis. Um, so uh, possibly uh, attacking collagen. Um, again, it sort of extends a little bit into the sclera, but not to that much. Um, so this case seems to be more confined to the cornea. Um, so it was just a nice kind of example um, of this disease in the cornea and how it can look um, more like a neoplastic infiltration um, as they suspected um, clinically, um, but in more like an immune mediated sort of idiopathic um, disease process. Uh, yep. So as I said, a severe granulomatous lymphoplasmocytic keratitis, um, a little bit of scleritis on um, that little uh, pre-irritable chronovascular membrane, and just a little bit of anterior uveitis um, to uh, wrap that up. Um, it is a 14-year-old dog, and I think um, this idiopathic diseases um, can be bilateral. Um, again, we didn't really have much else of a history, so I'm not sure if the other eye is doing okay or not, but um, a slightly older dog then it might not make much of a difference at this point. So next up, um, let's see. This is the right eye from a three year, seven month old rabbit, a New Zealand white rabbit. Uh, we actually ended up getting both eyes um, from this rabbit, uh, but we only photographed one. Um, our history was that we had bilateral aqueous flare and reduced, uh, oh, the aqueous flare, flare was bilateral. Uh, the right globe had reduced retropulsion, exophthalmus and bupthalmus. Um, and there were noted to be numerous white nodules on the anterior surface of the iris um, with iris thickening, uh, as well as retinal detachment. Um, so we can see the retinal detachment here. Um, we can see some nodules here, uh, back here in the choroid. Um, and it's probably a little bit hard to see um, the thickening, um, nodular thickening of the iris, um, but um, it is there and I will point it to you histologically. Um, and New Zealand white rabbits are albino. So you can see quite the lack of pigment um, in this globe. Um, so we did get both eyes. And both of them had similar findings, um, uh, kind of grossly antihistologically. Um, so, but I will focus on the right eye. It is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, oh my goodness. Leave it on and leave it alone. Okay. Um, so a lot of our thickening here um, is in the choroid. Um, again, it's probably a little bit hard to get it in focus, but we'll, fo we'll show you the iris as well. Um, I've got a couple of extra sections um, back here of the choroid. Um, you can see that it is thickened um, and infiltrated as well. Um, there's a couple of dark uh, purple foci, uh, which I will show you is actually mineralized areas of necrosis. And so kind of the pattern um, of infiltration that we have um, is looking like a metastatic tumor. So here's our choroid. Here's our retina that was detached, floating out here. Uh, we don't have a great section of the optic nerve head on this uh, globe, uh, but you can see the choroid is just expanded and effaced uh, by these neoplastic cells. 
as we move forward here, they are in the iris leaflets, forming nice little nodules. They're very cute. Um, and even out here um, in the conjunctiva as well. <coughs> um, again, as I mentioned, um, albino rabbit. Um, so you can see that the lack of pigment um, in the iris stroma and in the um, epithelium on the ciliary body and iris um, as well. And still, oh my goodness. So let's look at these cells. Um, they are polygonal cells um, with a lot of eosinophilic, um, <clears throat> sometimes vacuolated cytoplasm. The nuclei are round oval, uh, finely stippled. Um, I do have a nice prominent nucleus um, in here. Um, they're not really wearing name tags. Again, some of them get a little bit more vacuolated than others. Let's see. As I said, there are large areas of necrosis with mineralization amongst the neoplastic cells. And again, sort of this pattern of infiltration um, is indicative of a metastatic tumor uh, rather than a primary ocular tumor. Although we do see this as a primary ocular tumor in other cases. And so those are the iris in this group. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is a good example of how they sort of move to focal nature of the tumor and how it is identical to the main asking for. Yes. Yeah. So similar cells forming little satellite nodules here in the iris. Um, and I'm just going to briefly throw on the left eye just to show you that it was similarly affected um, by the same neoplastic population. Um, there's even a little raft of cells out here in the fat. And what I wanted to show not super surprising, um, but they are also in blood vessels um, in the core right here and a few other places elsewhere. And so we did um, we did get these um, eyes <coughs> after the rabbit had been euthanized, I'm assuming for poor doing and poor condition um, and after necropsy. Um, with the additional history that at some point there was a penal mass that was previously removed from this rabbit. What kind of mass? A penal mass oh, penal. from the ear so um, <laughs> um, that some other lab had read the histology for and had diagnosed a malignant neoplasm, and they had presumed it was an amelanotic melanoma. Um, I did not see the report, so I'm not sure if they had any other testing done for that or if that was just their presumption. Yeah, and the comment they suggested IHC, but then it was never pursued. All right, so they suggested IHC, but not pursued, but we have the case now, and so we pursued IHC, and so we did a melan A, and all of the cells are beautifully staying positive for the melan A. So this is a melanoma, uh, a melanotic melanoma. Um, and at uh, youth um, at necropsy, uh, there were actually metastatic nodules several places in the body, um, including the subcutis, skeletal muscle, costal pleura, and mediastinal lymph nodes, esophagus, lungs, I think liver, the glomeruli. Sorry, it might have been easier to tell you where it wasn't. Um, 
<laughs> um, so um, just thought that was pretty interesting case. Um, pretty cool to see the little um, nodules in the iris that they saw uh, clinically. <laughs> um, so a uh, metastatic malignant, malignant uh, and melanotic melanoma with vascular invasion um, in this albino eye. <laughs> um, I didn't focus on it too much, um, but it briefly showed the retinal detachment and then there were some um, atrophy a little bit in the retina um, as well. So just kind of an interesting whole case from our rabbit. We had a long uh, Googling and discussion about whether melanoma would be expressed by a melanotic melanoma <laughs> and concluded that possibly it would. So we, we were nicely rewarded. <laughs> yes. All right, the next one, case 7,000. This is um, we're not supposed to say the pets' names, but sometimes, sometimes the names are relevant, <laughs> especially when the patient is called Magoo or Pirate. <laughs> or you know something that relates to a potential uh, ocular disease prior to the naming of the animal. So this is Magoo, um, and that's the only reason I'm revealing that. It's an eight-year-old may neuter domestic short-haired cat. They describe a preridal fibrovascular membrane with irritable thickening, one plus flare, keratic precipitates, and a lot of fibrin in the anterior chamber on both eyes. But we ought to receive the right eye now because it developed outcome. They also described an inflammatory debris over the lens capsule and cataract. Uh, interestingly, on general medical conditions, they describe normal uh, body weight and not much going on except the mildly elevated ALP. Um, and this is what we received. We can see is a cat, got a cat fundus, the tapetum. Uh, there's a so the optic nerve is right there, and there's a beautiful retinal detachment and tear. You can see how the retina is folded on itself. The retina is detached and folded, but it looks thickened. It looks like there's more, um, there's something added to that detached retina rather than just, you know, being folded. If you look in the background here in the exposed choroid. There are multifocal areas of uh, white nodular structures on the tapetal area. You lose a little bit of the tapetum, right? And uh, moving forward in the anterior chamber, you can see the fibrin that they described. There's a lot of uh, this pale material floating around. There's thickening of the iris, what looks like posterior synechia, where the iris contacts the lens capsule, and that debris they talk about uh, in the anterior uh, lens capsule, but also it kind of follows around. Um, it carpets the ciliary body and surrounds uh, the lens posteriorly. So let's get to it. First, let me find this light. There you go. Let me clean it better. There is a Jesus. Yeah, that will not come off. I think it's uh, mounting media. Anyway, here is the subgross. As you can see, the retinal detachment and tear is relatively obvious. The thickening of the retinal tissue, especially the part that's adjacent to the optic nerve, it's kind of a uh, uh, Easy to recognize here. <clears throat> What's easier to see histologically is all that proteinaceous material in the anterior chamber, right? The iris leaflets kind of bend back a little bit. Uh, so there's a fibrovascular membrane causing posterior synechia. 
but redder than that looks a little less impressive than the gross um, image. There is a banana section here that looks very cellular. So we're gonna spend some time with that also. All right. So start in the front. I apologize for the the artifact there. Uh, let's try to ignore that, even though it really hurts. <laughs> you can see all the proteinaceous exudate in the interior chamber, so kind of easy to correlate that with the. Uh, um, clinically described fibrin and, and flare by all those cells um, floating around. Another nice clinical correlation is the presence of these clusters of inflammatory cells connected to the essence membrane that correlates with the description of keratic precipitates. And in this case, these are neutrophils with a few macrophages kind of forming this beautiful little uh, hanging structures adjacent to the corneal endothelium. And here's a little bit of more normal corneal endothelium. Sorry about the lack of focus. That's because of the, of the artifact. All right, then if we move towards the iris or the iris leaflets, it's extensively infiltrated and expanded by is basophilic cells in multiple areas, like here. There's a loss of the identifiable anterior surface of the iris. So there are areas almost of necrosis. There's marked disruption of the pigmented epithelium, right? And you can see it coming around and there's fibrin exudating from that iris leaflet. Let's take a look at the other side and we'll come back to that. Similar situation here, markedly expanded iris leaflet um, there is a, well, I want to give it away, but there's a bubbliness to it, right? I can see how pale the background is. There are some inflammatory cells, but there are ex these extensive areas of, um, vacuolation and paleness, right? We'll, we'll look at it a little bit closer in a bit. Um, there is a cataract. You can see some degeneration of the lens fibers. If we'll look at it closer again. Just want to give you guys a, a whole um, tour of the eye before we get there. So the inflammatory cells or the cells, they do infiltrate the limbus and the equatorial sclera. They form well-defined nodules. And I don't know if you guys remember those pale areas uh, that we've seen on the exposed aura grossly, those correlate with these areas where there's that same infiltrate in the surface of the exposed choroid. Here's the optic nerve. Here's the very sad retina. It's detached, markedly atrophied, uh, hard to identify any of the layers. And again, more of that bubbliness, more of that vacuolation throughout. This is straight up retinal necrosis, right? You can identify that as a retina because of the shape and morphology, but there are barely any viable cells in that area. So let's go back to the iris and then we'll work our way back. Oh, let's start on the other one because I remember it look better. Okay, so our options now are something inflammatory, something uh, 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 neoplastic, and then we can move on from there. Right away, it's obvious that there's a uh, heterogeneity to the whole thing. And there's obvious that there are more than, uh, there are lots of things in there. So we got lymphocytes and plasma cells and surrounding there are lots of macrophages and organisms. So all of them, you have a nucleus in the center and a very large, poorly stained or non-stained capsule around it. Uh, the structure's in the center, the nucleus in the center. Let me get a little closer. I can't, we don't have a 60X here. Um, they're kind of oblong, round to oblong, um, but the presence of this large 
the halo around it where it's a non-staining capsule. It's pathognomonic of this organism. So this is Cryptococcus. I have a few that are dividing or coexisting. Um, and it's just impressive how many organisms there are. So all the areas that I was pointing out as being vacuolated or bubbly are rafts of organisms everywhere. So this is still Iris stroma. Right, you can see the epithelium there. If you keep going around, and that's interesting, um, when you go to the episclera, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a little while, but I'm pretty sure I found a lot of these organisms inside the episcleral vessels. It's not surprising. You know, it is a systemic process. You can see this, the, the arrangement of these raft cells is, is strongly suggests that they're inside vessels. When we, when we move back, all these areas on the surface of the quarry are identical to what we have seen so far. So mostly macro, so mostly uh, organisms. Um, because of the capsule, uh, Cryptococcus has, it tends to um, dampen the immunologic response against itself because you know, it's relatively protected. So it's not uncommon for us to see this, uh, you know, poorly cellular response to organisms. Um, this is much more than what we usually see. There are lots of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages, but there are cases where there is just a very minimal macrophage histocytic reaction to the presence of these organisms. Um, just wanted to point out how much, uh, like, like the vast majority of what we're seeing of the celerity here is just cryptococcus organisms. When we go towards the optic nerve, Another important feature and another uh, kind of concerning feature is the fact that they go to the optic nerve and there are lots of organisms infiltrating the optic nerve beyond the margins that we have here. So it's not uncommon to see cryptococcus, uh, ocular cryptococcus is associated with uh, central nervous system cryptococcus. Well, I mean, the optic nerve is part of the central nervous system. So it's kind of a stupid statement there because it's already in the central nervous system, but extending into the brain, let's put it that way, right? And our retina, poor retina is, uh, has to share space with the uh, fungal organisms, not very conducive to vision. So retinal detachment, retinal atrophy, and colonization of the retina by all these organisms. And just to um, wrap it up, it's a beautiful example of retinal necrosis. So here, here's a little bit of retina where you still have some identifiable glial cells. Probably all, all of those are Miller cells and some photoreceptors, but right there, you can actually trace a line where it divides from still viable retina to necrotic retina. And what's left are just the ghosts of past neurons and degenerated necrotic acellular vascular uh, profiles. So this is a beautiful example of retinal necrosis. Um, of course, with all those uh, microorganisms infiltrating the retina and also affecting the choroid, um, it's not hard to imagine that there was a vascular compromise that led to ischemic retinal necrosis here. So this is what we got. In our final diagnosis of necrotized in histocytic and lymphoplasmocytic panivitis, suppressive endothelitis, and myriad intralesional fungal yeasts consistent with cryptococcus. So the, uh, the, the lack of systemic disease described clinically is interesting. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that this cat has crypt ocular cryptococcus. It appears to be bilateral based on the description or the clinical description where they describe similar lesions in both eyes. Um, and we know that most of these cases are associated with systemic fungal disease or deep fungal diseases. So uh, more likely a respiratory disease that led to a systemic cryptococcosis. Um, the presence of organisms in the optic nerve is concerning for a spread into the central nervous system. 
And it's likely that this cat also has a more profound systemic disease than what uh, they have described. With that, 9 a.m. sharp here on our end, and we're going to leave you guys there. Thanks for uh, joining us, and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Thank you.